Hello and welcome to Roundtable. Europe, it appears, wants to increase its presence in the Horn of Africa, moving away from just development to focusing on security issues. But it's being accused of engaging in a great power competition. A couple of weeks ago, Claire Daly, Irish member of the European Parliament, had this to say. That the last thing the Horn of Africa needs is more foreign military bases, more weapons and more European meddling. So what is driving Europe's renewed focus in the Horn of Africa and what is it hoping to achieve there? Good to have you along. I'm David Foster. The Horn of Africa has always attracted the attention of foreign powers and Europe is no exception. It's located at the crossroads between the Middle East and Africa and the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea surrounding it are considered of increasing strategic importance to the European Union. Military bases and ports continue to multiply in the coastal areas of the region. The foreign players involved aren't just the usual suspects, Russia, China and the United States, but also Gulf states, Turkey and European nations such as France, Germany and Italy. What are these countries after? And is Europe any different from the other foreign powers accused of meddling in the horn? We go first to Nairobi, Kenya and see Alexander Rondos, former EU special representative for the Horn of Africa. Welcome, and then to Washington, D.C. And we say hello to Michael Waldemary. I'm Associate Professor in the School of Public Policy at the University of Maryland. And across town, or across city, if you like, also in Washington, D.C., Abdullahi Boru Halaki, an analyst on Horn of Africa security. Alexander, I'm going to come to you first of all. K Kenya is considered to be part of the Horn of Africa. You are no longer the special representative, but you studied it for a very, very long time. Is there any one thing in particular right now that is making European countries or the EU as a whole more concerned about what is happening in the Horn? Oh, oh yes, indeed. The intensification of the fighting in the highlands of Ethiopia, uh, surrounding in and surrounding Iraq, is, is not just a local insurrection. It is a fight between huge armies that could result in massive movements of population and could also uh, result in, in a real disturbance in the whole Horn of Africa. It, the, the future is being rewritten for the Horn as, as, as I speak to you with the battles that are going on. And do you have any particular reason for thinking that this is happening now? Well, I think we, we have contending parties, one of which intends to survive, the others intend that it succumbs, it's a battle to the end. And certainly two of the parties, Eritrea and Tigray, would regard it as an existential one. So it, it's been brewing. This is the third round of fighting in the last three years. Um, one wonders whether any of the sides can continue to exhaust themselves further. The hemorrhage in blood and treasure is, is, is beyond imagination. Abdullahi, let me come to you. Security in the Horn of Africa speciality. We've heard there from Alexander Eritrea, Tigray province, Ethiopia, the, the, the bloodshed that is uh, being spilled there. But there are many other countries across, across the Horn. Where in particular, other than Ethiopia and its surrounds, do you see problems? I think Somalia still remains one of the biggest net exports of uh, conflict in the region. You know, the presence of Al-Shabaab, as we speak right now, um, upward of 90,000 people are in Al-Shabaab controlled areas in a region that is facing 40, almost 40 odd years um, of drought that we've not witnessed in the region. Uh, just like in 2011, 2012 drought that led to farming in Somalia, these people in Al-Shabaab controlled areas are likely to die because a... Um, you know, because of the very expansive, if not onerous, inter uh, international counterterrorism uh, regime, uh, humanitarian groups will not be able to program in those regions. Um, they are afraid of that. Secondly, even if they are allowed, uh, you know, humanitarian counterterrorism carve-outs are allowed, 
Uh, Al Shabaab also have, have very broad, uh, you know, humanitarian mechanism through which they extort most of the humanitarian groups. So I think for me, combined with what is going on inside Ethiopia now, uh, with what is going on in Somalia, really makes the situation incredibly fragile. Michael, I'm going to come to you, but that's after we've seen a map showing the area and, and which countries have what bases where, right up from Sudan in the far north down to the border of Somalia and Kenya. You have China, France, Italy, Japan, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, United Arab Emirates and the USA. This is nothing new, wanting to have control over this area because it's such an important shipping route and security can spill and there are migrant issues. But what are these countries doing now that they didn't want to do five or ten years ago? Well, I think there, there are a lot of different layers to this. Um, and you sort of have to look at particular ex extra-regional powers and, and what their interests are. Um, if you look at uh, countries from the Middle East, uh, Turkey, the UAE, um, Saudi Arabia, um, I think they are looking to protect a particular security interest, right? So they see the Horn of Africa as they're near abroad uh, in an area uh, where they need to uh, deny influence to some of their adversaries um, or uh, for um, political configurations, ideological trends that might be dangerous to those, uh, those particular countries and their governments. Um, there also is, I would say, a commercial aspect to some of this. So if you look in particular at the Gulf countries, I think they are trying to transition, make halting steps towards a sort of post-oil economy. And given that the Horn of Africa is there near abroad, um, I think they see this as, as a potential opportunity. I mean, some big markets in this region, Ethiopia's second most populous country in Africa. You, of course, have Sudan. Um, and I think they are looking to capitalize on some economic opportunities there. Um, and so that, I think, is, is part of what's going on. So what you see is uh, both the militarization of the region, right, because through military presence, you can cultivate um, political influence and pursue your security interests, but also efforts uh, to acquire commercial stakes. And so uh, Gulf countries, uh, China, are also in involved in, in port development in this particular part of the world. So there, there are multiple layers to this. Let's have another listen to a little extension or a little bit more of what Claire Daly, the MEP, had to say about uh, raping this area of Africa. What we call our strategic relationship isn't about human flourishing, it's about the EU's ambitions as a superpower. There's now a new great game in the Horn of Africa. Greater and lesser powers are pockmarking the place with military bases, France, the US, China, Germany, Japan, Italy, Saudi Arabia, all have a presence in the tiny area of Djibouti alone. Mercenaries are swarming in from all quarters. The entire region is being militarized. War is in the air. And what about the people facing climate and food insecurity? None of this benefits them. Alexander Rondos, does, does she have a point that with everybody piling in there, the situation isn't going to calm down in any way? Yes, there is a point, but um, if I may say it's a rather lazy point, um, it's time to just sort of kind of be trampled by the fact. Yeah. Uh, this is a region that is historically extremely fragile, and just at the moment when we thought it might be turning a corner to something better, it was entirely internally driven problems that emerged within their transitions, whether it's in Ethiopia or, or Sudan, which are the two largest land masses in the region, that generated a new type of capability. That is, it is in those contexts that an external element, call it in the Middle East, the Gulf, Europe much less so these days, um, and the China, obviously, choose to become involved to, to, to protect their interests. So what are the interests here? One is the Red Sea, one of the major trade routes. So either it's, it's, it's a, a, a way through which trade flows and has a huge significance economically, or it becomes a bottleneck because of instability on either side of the Red Sea. I mean, Yemen on the one, and then the whole coastline, that eastern coastline of the Red Sea. If, if you've got that, people naturally are attra attracted to it. The question is the following. This region is not in itself politically coherent. Therefore, it tends to compete within itself very often 
and, and devotes less time to navigating its collective interests with an international community that has become, as we all know, much more fragile, fractious, and potentially competitive. So the, the, the possibilities of a new scramble for this region, more by default rather than absolute design by any one power, is the problem. And can the region insulate itself from that, or does it just want to become a proxy, or do elements within the region want to become proxies for those powers? It turns into a rather messy marketplace. Well, you, you talk about how important it is, how busy it is. A tenth of global trade actually goes through uh, the Red Sea, uh, 6.2 million barrels of crude oil, instability, famine, war. We've gone through some of those, making migration a problem for, for Europe. And 140 million people, fast-growing economies and very young populations, for example, Ethiopia and Kenya. Alexander, I was reading an article that you wrote for a political magazine not so very long ago in which you say, if we manipulate Europe, we will get our fingers burned. On the other hand, we cannot let authoritarianism rule. By not letting authoritarianism rule, you are actually getting involved, manipulating, and you're doing exactly what you say shouldn't be done. The danger is that Europe will get its fingers burned, perhaps. It, the issue is manipulating in the wrong way. Either we establish a proper relationship with governments in Africa. I'm talking now as if I were back in my original position, but I'm not but it is about having a type of conversation with countries in Africa where one sees how does one protect one's interests and, and come to some arrangement. That's not manipulation. I, I was saying that in a completely different context quite a few years ago. Um, this is about establishing a relationship between two continents, Europe and Africa, that are frankly joined at the hip. Um, and if they don't sort out that relationship between themselves on issues of security, but above all, on, on the enormous potential of economic cooperation, investment and the like, I think it's a huge opportunity missed for both populations. And let me just conclude by saying on that, Europe is an infertile society and static at, and doesn't want to admit it. And Africa is growing, as you mentioned, at an astonishing rate with a population that's young and dynamic, educated, connected, and people aren't looking at the real opportunities for, for real cooperation. Yeah, 60%, so me, 60, percent, 60 percent is the figure I got of, of under 18s. If I could just move on for a moment, because I want to include everybody in this. Abdullahi, come to you. Uh, we pulled up that map that showed the various countries that are involved, all the way up from Sudan down to Kenya. Um, give us an idea of the, the military side of what is being concentrated in that part of the world. Djibouti, one particular example. Do you, do you want to concentrate on that, or is that up to you? Yeah, I, th I think over the last 20 years, I think that the primary lens with which Europe uh, looked, at not just the region, but the entire continent, is through the lens of security. So as a result, you know, this small country, Djibouti, has had, you know, fortune or the misfortune of having a concentration of not just the first power, you know, Europe, uh, Western Europe largely, as well as, you know, North America having their military bases. You've got China and all the rest. But the reality is sometimes when discussions are had about the relationship between Africa and Europe or even with the United States, it is generally looked at as, as A, um, why is African country having a, a relationship with a third country? Uh, you know, over the last few years, it was China, and the sense was, um, although misguided, was, uh, it was around, you know, the debt trap-led diplomacy, which the figures do not bear out. Now, increasingly, it's Russia, and then, you know, uh, the Gulf countries and the rest. The second one is, does it dawn on most of the policymakers as well as analysts of the region that sometimes African countries also, including the Horn and even Djibouti, they are having this relationship based on their internal strategic calculation? You know, look at Djibouti. The last election, the current president won by over 90 percent. There is no way with all these interests, particularly from the West and others, 
that he will ever be questioned about his human rights record. So I think he's making a very clear, you know, uh, strategic, if not personal calculation. But well, it, it, it's a backward and forwards arrangement, isn't it? I mean, the, the, the people in charge of these governments um, want to have the, the power of these big countries behind them, but equally the big countries want to be able to, I don't know whether manipulate is the right word, because as um, Alexander was saying, it, it's loaded to some extent, but they want to be able to use their influence in these countries to gain an advantage for themselves. So, Michael, I, I want to pick up on something that Abdullahi may have just hinted at, China's influence. Is it waning? in Africa, because what did they put in a trillion dollars or will be putting in a trillion dollars into the, the Belt and Road Initiative? And that part of Africa is absolutely crucial to it. But are other countries muscling in a little bit more, telling China or China's now having to back off a bit? Well, certainly, I mean, if we, we look at this from the perspective of the United States, I think China's expanding influence in the Horn of Africa is a particular concern, right? And one has to put this uh, in, in the broader global context of increasing acrimony uh, between Washington, Beijing, and I would also add Moscow. Um, and so, you know, for a considerable period of time, the United States was the primary geopolitical player in the Horn. It had the big base in Djibouti and all the relevant uh, military and security partnerships in the region. Uh, China's base in Djibouti, I think, changes the dynamic a bit, and the United States is, is trying to grapple uh, with that reality. Um, it's also looking very closely at, at expanding, uh, expanding Russian influence uh, through uh, the Wagner Group and, and other mechanisms. And as I understand it, you know, Russia has been looking uh, to find some real estate uh, a along the Red Sea corridor. So uh, the short answer is I think the United States is, is trying to find ways to push back. Um, but then you've got other uh, players that I mentioned earlier that are relevant, Turkey, the Gulf countries, um, who on some level may see China's expanding influence in the Horn as compatible with their own security and economic interests. But at certain times in certain places, it, it might diverge as well. Would they so rather they, have all... China than another big power? Well, um, I think if we look, for instance, uh, at the commercial side of the equation, right, and we look, for instance, I'll give you an example, the Emiratis and their interest in port development in the Horn of Africa, um, there are some complementarities between BRI Chinese infrastructure in the Horn that connects um, uh, landlocked economies like Ethiopia to some of these Horn of Africa ports that, that, the, that the Emiratis are, are running and trying to run. And so there are economic complementarities there as well. At the same time, uh, Chinese geopolitical influence and Russian geopolitical influence in the Horn does on some level dilute the influence of, of some of the big Gulf powers and Turkey. Um, so it, it's not, all, uh, what I'm suggesting here, it's not all zero sum from the perspective of some of these Middle Eastern countries. Um, there, there are other calculations mm -hmm. and complementarities that, that are possible. Alexander, you're in Nairobi. You may know this chap, Dennis Muneni, who's the executive director of the China Africa Center in Kenya. I've been reading something that he put out for um, the China Daily within the last couple of weeks. And I want you to look at this and tell me whether, in fact, it's, it's an honest assessment or whether you would have a wry smile at this one sentence. Having already established the outlook for peace and development in the Horn of Africa, China is poised to offer its assistance in terms of food security to needing developing countries there. Is that um, a realistic assessment of what China's doing? Well, I think there's maybe a slight confusion between hope and reality. Um, it's it's much more complicated for China. They've invested heavily in this region, in this country, in Ethiopia. Um, debts have accrued, managing those. Uh, I think uh, China, uh, if uh, my, my feeling about China sometimes is that it, it reminds me of a bit like the old great colonial trading corporations. And then suddenly they collide with political reality and, and need to work out that their investment and trade and debt they've created actually creates, um, it has an, a political impact which they must address. So, you know, I think um, China also knows that it has to adapt to the shifting realities that we've been talking about, not least the demographic one. When 60, 70 percent of the population are under the age of 30, this is a tidal, a demographic tidal wave that's breaking on, on the shores of this region and of Africa. And sometimes those who are less uh, regimes that are less accustomed to dealing with Vox Populi and the, and the public sentiment are sometimes in for a shock. 
What do you think the European Union and indeed or individual countries should be hoping to do next that would be most beneficial for the bloc as a whole or for European nations in this part of the world? There is a policy. What do you think it should prioritize? I invest economically. I don't mean development aid. I mean real investment. There's an entire generation uh, who will before long be taking over in, in Africa. Uh, align with them. Uh, because if you don't, they'll drift in other directions, whether it is that geographically, uh, ideologically, economically, or whatever. Uh, it's, it's very straightforward. Invest in education, invest in the growth of business. Around that, those will be the drivers of the future decision makers and decision making. It sounds a bit general, but that's what it is. Um, aid per se is fine, but it is not a strategy. Okay, Abdullaki, back with you in just a moment to sort of help round off the program. But Michael, I want to come to you at this particular point. Alexander says invest in the younger people in Africa, make sure it's economic investment. But European countries at the moment are all rather strapped. So is this a priority? Well, I think you always have to keep the long-term picture in mind, right? And I think investing in, in these countries and their, their societies and their young people is, is important. Um, but I'd also add, I mean, I think that the particular policy conundrum right now uh, for extra-regional parties as it relates to the Horn of Africa is, is resolving some of the major uh, political and security crises in the region. I think um, as Ambassador Rondos alluded to at the beginning of this program, I think the, the crisis in Ethiopia looms particularly large. I, I don't think there is a path uh, to regional peace and stability without resolving the crisis in that very big and important country. Uh, and then, of course, you've got the, the effectively thwarted transition to civilian rule in Sudan. I think a lot of effort needs to be put around resolving those twin crises um, and, then, and then move to, I think, the longer term picture. Okay, Abdullahi, let me come to you. Um, we were hearing from Alexander about China having a lot of countries indebted to it, but having somebody owe you money is a price you're willing to let them pay so that you can have influence over them when it comes to arm twisting. So that's China's position. It may be the position of other countries as well. And then we also heard the idea of investing economically in young people, giving them prospects, which may be the other side of the same coin. Uh, who appears to be winning here? I think the reality, I think, if we look at it from purely an African point of view, none of them, it's, it's neither of them. You know, you need the Chinese for the hardware, because a lot of the time we fail to realize that there is a serious infrastructure gap in some of these countries, and those infrastructures are, in, are needed. I think the Western countries will provide the software. You know, you cannot have, you know, building of this infrastructure minus the trust and governance deficit, never mind, you know, the environmental impact assessment that needs to be done. I think from an African perspective, being able to double dip or even triple or multiple dip to be able to lift enough number of people out of poverty uh, is far more important. I think, I think um, the prof alluded to peace and security. I mean, like, if you look at, let's say, Ethiopia and Somalia, the chief problem right now is insecurity in, you know, many parts inside Ethiopia, apart from just the Tigrayan region, as well as in South Central in Somalia. But then again, climate change is something that will not know boundaries, and it will come and, you know, um, really uh, destroy most of the good things that have been done as a result of relationship between Europe and Africa. And is it possible for all of these vested interests to fit together rather nicely to make a rather peaceful jigsaw for that part of Africa and for the rest of the world, by extension? It's not that easy, but I think it requires a great deal of courage. It requires a great deal of uh, creativity in terms of the policy environment. You know, trying to do these delicate dances will be critical. And I think sometimes, you know, Western countries forget the tremendous amount of leader, let alone the use of the language, you know, a critical mass of educated people in Western countries, particularly in Europe. But the European countries look at this as a zero sum game. China gains, we lose. If Gulf countries gain, we lose. No, Western countries have got tremendous amount of leg up. Most of these countries at least have elections. They might not be free, fair, and you know, truly democratic. 
they have a core of leaders and many who would want to come and study in some of these countries. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to stop you there. Uh, we could talk for hours, days. Thank you very much indeed. Maybe we will on another occasion. Great to have you from Kenya, Mr. Ambassador. Great to have you, Professor. And Abdullahi, thank you very much indeed, both of you from Washington, D.C. Wherever you happen to be watching this edition of Roundtable, we thank you heartily for taking the time and showing the interest and hope you do so next time as well. From me, David Foster, goodbye.